how is all this happening? So these are the five lessons coming out of five stories, which brings me back to the loose ties and Twitter in Singapore. One of the folks who I added, when I went through that list of top Twitter users in Singapore was Tan Siak Siak. Now, I don't know Siak Siak. I love the name though. I said, I'm adding this. This looks interesting. This is a great name. I like it. I don't have a great name like that. I need one. And uh, so I, I added her. And of course, as I added, I, I took a little bit of time and I looked at some of the topics that she was tweeting about and cool name, good content. I'm adding her. I think I added maybe six or eight of the top people on that Singapore list. And as I saw the tweets coming in, I suddenly realized that, aha, she's a filmmaker. I didn't bother to go look up her bio. I only looked at the content that was being shared. That was all I was interested in was the content. As a knowledge worker, do you have content that's useful to me? And if yes, I'll add you. So I started following her and she's a filmmaker. Okay, so I start looking this up and she apparently created uh, a very successful documentary around the Beijing Olympics. And uh, I also find out that uh, she's actually a Singaporean, a Singaporean living in Beijing, making documentaries. So, and this story is getting a little bit more interesting. So I started to slowly respond to a few of her tweets. And we start exchanging a little bit of information. And along the way, I find out that she has this concept called a Twitamentary. Now, I have no idea. I will be honest. I had no idea what a Twitamentary is. But this sounded a little bit interesting. So I kind of looked up the website. And OK, so she's making another film. But it didn't quite capture my attention yet. But all of a sudden, Folks who I do follow very closely on Twitter started saying, hey, Siak Siak has a new project coming. Go check this out. So I stopped. I looked more closely. And sure enough, this is actually a very interesting project. So I send her a tweet and say, would you like to come to my class? My students could, could hear what you're doing with Twitter and how you're making this into a film. Sure, she's next time in Singapore, I'd love to come talk to your students. Let's get your students involved. Okay, uh, gee, how can we do that? So I start looking at the website again. I start seeing what she's doing. And I say, this is really interesting. Can I interview you? I, I'm a correspondent on a podcast, today's version of radio. Uh, correspondent on this podcast, I think people around the globe would really like to hear what you're doing. So what I'd like to do right now is share with you about a three minute excerpt from that interview. Uh, the interview went live on Tuesday morning. You'll, you'll see the website listed here. But this is Siak Siak talking to us about what a Twitamentary is and the way in which this new media is being combined with a more traditional form of communication, that being filmmaking. So here we have Twitamentary in Siak Siak's own words. Whoop, I'm sorry, there we go. Itself. Okay, well, uh, as the name suggests, although Twitamentary is spelled T-W-I-T-T-A-M-E-N-T-A-R-Y, people always mistake it for uh, another, another spelling. Um, well, Twittermentary, as the name suggests, is a, is a documentary about the uh, popular microblog blogging service called Twitter. And what makes the project unusual is that we're not doing it in a traditional way. It's actually a film project that's based on social media. Uh, as in, we collect, we, we ask for submission of ideas and videos from Twitter users. We actually built a special uh, web platform just to do that and so it's partially crowdsourced uh, and I'm actually in the midst of doing uh, video interviews um, with people around the world. I have two interviews to do tonight. So, so that, that's it's a very unusual project in the sense that it brings together film, filmmaking, social media and web development and it's the first time 
I've ever done a film like that. I, I, I jokingly say that, uh, well, not so jokingly, it's a completely insane way to make a film. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it, it, is. If, if it is insane, where, where did you get the idea for this? Why are you doing it? One very big reason for doing a documentary about Twitter is first, I, I, I'm an avid Twitter user. I've been using it since uh, December of 2007. And in fact, it was a very instrumental tool for my promotion of my last film, uh, the Beijing Olympics um, film that I made um, in, in 2007, that, that actually was premiered in 2008. So I, I, think the, I think one of the reasons to make a film about Twitter is that I, I sense, and as we can see with the great amount of media coverage about Twitter, is that some very profound changes have happened to the, the web, um, social media, and communications, and human connections because of Twitter. And yet, um, it remains uh, very inexplicable to people who don't use Twitter. I, I have plenty of friends uh, who think that uh, Twitter is completely stupid and um, nonsensical, it's a fad, it will go away soon. So in a way, Twitter is both hot a very hot topic and also somewhat controversial. And most importantly for the art of filmmaking, uh, there's something about the experience that's inexplicable to people who don't go through it. And I feel that film, much better than text or words, is a good medium for communicating something that's inexplicable, that cannot ex be explained in linear logic. Okay, so what Go, going back to those those loose ties that we saw in the opening network, Syak Syak is relying on those ties to go to a website, to share their story about Twitter, to further develop their story about Twitter, and basically determine what's going to be in her documentary, what's going to be in her Twitimentary. Now, I'm not a filmmaker, but my experience with filmmaking, in particular doing video case studies, nothing like this. We have to plan what are our goals. We have to put together a script. Then we start storyboarding. Then we start filming. And, and this is a very, very different process than what Siak Siak is describing. And let me just jump back up. This, this is the very simple website that she has created. Anybody can go to this website and share their story about Twitter. And you can actually tweet your story in, in 140 characters if you would like. You can go in and write your story. You can submit videos if you prefer. But there are, there are many ways of putting the content in this particular site. So basically, what she is doing is, it's a term that's become popular over the last couple of years. She is basically crowdsourcing. She's allowing the crowds out there to become the source and the guidance for the information that goes into her work. And this is fairly common. A, a lot of organizations today have adopted, for example, prediction markets, where they'll let the public predict what they think is going to happen next. our ability to go out to crowds and to gather information and translate that into some sort of usable form, that was a pretty complex and expensive proposition, whether it was focus groups or survey studies or if you've ever worked with Nielsen or better yet, signed the PO for Nielsen, you'll, you'll know how much these things cost. But this is basically a very low cost proposition for the expense associated with her time, hosting the website and creating this website, she can basically now have the whole world creating the content for her Twitimentary. And she has people like me who are going onto the podcast and telling the world, coming to events like this and telling the world, going onto Twitter and telling the world, hey, go look at what Siak Siak's doing. This is really interesting. And we tend to listen to our friends.
That's one of the big differences. We tend to listen to our friends. So as I think about the example that Siak Siak has, has offered to us, a couple of ideas come to mind. At the most basic level, the change that we're seeing with Twitter, with blogs, with podcastings, or, or social networking sites, these are very, very fundamental changes. The last time society saw uh, a technological change this fundamental was when the computer came into mainstream society. Before that, it would have been television, prior to that, radio, and prior to that, the Industrial Revolution, and then going back to the, the printing press. But these eras in, in society, do, in history, they, they don't come about very often. And it's, it's fascinating to be living at a time where we can see how society, how work, how knowledge reorganizes itself around the technology. And as we reorganize ourselves, I think as Siak Siak has illustrated, there is very, very rich opportunity for creativity and for innovation. Uh, business scholars for decades have studied the value of social networks to business innovation. Now we are seeing this on a social scale because of these digital technologies. And unfortunately, I, I think these creativity issues, these opportunities for innovation, sometimes get pushed to the background because we're more concerned with copyright protection and IP infringement, for example. But I hope that we don't allow those concerns to outweigh the incredible opportunity for creativity and innovation that are embedded. And crowdsourcing is simply one of those examples. As I think about the conversations that these digital networks are unleashing, uh, I was sharing with one of the audience members earlier that I'm having a very unique conversation in my digital media class right now. My students distributed online a, an illegal copy of their textbook. Now, I won't ask how many people photocopied textbooks during their or school days. I know that's a fairly common practice on this side of the globe, and uh, I'm fighting an uphill battle. But what happened is that uh, I told the class that the book was available in the bookstore. And a student responded to that by posting a link to a digitized copy. And of course, are you going to pay $32.50 Singh to go get the book or are you going to take the digitized copy? Okay, we know the answer here. So I did something a little bit different. I said, is this, I, I went online. We have an online conversation room. It's called Friend Feed. I, I'll have, I'm happy to share it with anybody. But I went online and I said, is this, uh, is this a good idea knowing that I'm the guy who created copyright protection at the university, it looks really bad if my class is, is uh, breaking the law. But in addition to that, as, as business people, future business leaders, do you really want to go into a market where everybody's distributing your content for free and you get none of the benefits for your hard work? what business person would go into that market? I would expect my students to understand that. Well, okay, maybe I'm being a little idealistic. But from that point forward, I, got, I invited the textbook author to get involved in the conversation and he posed a question to them. Would you want me coming into your apartment and stealing your money? And we now have this long conversation going on about you know, is this ethical, is it not ethical, uh, how can we justify it, how is this different than a library if I went and borrowed the book and then returned it. They're, they're thinking through these issues. But what struck me is prior to these digital networks where we're having these conversations, would anybody actually have a meaningful conversation with their students about copyright protection and not stealing a textbook? Would we just look the other way and keep going? Probably so. So for me, this has opened up, that's just a simple example of the conversations this opens up and the opportunities to, to create an educational experience which just simply did not exist before.